Today on the John Ingeberg Show, each fall, millions of young women enter college expecting to experience the best four years of their life. Yet college often presents unexpected challenges of dealing with roommates, facing the pressures of grades and finances, encountering the party scene, and experiencing the loneliness of being far from parents and family, all of these can cause tremendous struggles. Spiritually, recent surveys report that roughly 70% of Christians who go off to college end up leaving their faith during their first year on campus. How can you avoid becoming part of this discouraging trend? Best-selling author Hannah Seymour has mentored college women for over a decade through the vast array of challenges they face. Her best-selling book, The College Girl's Survival Guide, answers the top 52 concerns she has received from college women about roommate dramas, boyfriend troubles, choosing a major, balancing family and school life, sexual assaults, and much, much more. While college is far from the easiest four years of your life, they will be some of the most formative years of your adult life. You will decide who you are, what you believe in, and what you do with it all. In this series, Hannah Seymour and Michelle Ankerberg join me for an insightful discussion regarding what it takes to handle the unexpected challenges and pressures of college life. Their words are vital for any woman already in college or those heading to college this fall. So join us for today's edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and I'm glad that you're here today. And I've got two special guests. One is best-selling author Hannah Seymour. And when I say best-selling neighbors, she went on Fox News to sell her book, The College Girl's Survival Guide. They interviewed her, and while they were interviewing her, Amazon sold out every book they had, and they were having to tell people they have to call them back. All right? Now, that's what you call a hot seller. That's what we're gonna talk about today. And uh, along with Hannah, we're glad that you're here today. Hannah Seymour, we've got my daughter Michelle because they uh, have so many college experiences, especially today in this program we're gonna talk about today, that I wanted them to kind of talk together. Guys are out of this one. This is, a, this is for girls, for women here, all right? And uh, we're gonna talk about this issue of uh, how do you live with a roommate who's a total stranger, okay? You go to the university, and uh, some of these universities have 20,000 students, some have 40,000 students, some have a little less, some have a little bit more, and all of a sudden the list comes up and you are assigned a little tiny room, okay? And you got two beds or maybe even three beds, and you have never met these people you're gonna live with before. And neighbors, this causes sometimes a little friction, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And Michelle, you got the first question. Yes, well, I love that we're talking about this, Hannah, because we have both faced this in the past, and so many girls are, are facing this today. And so someone wrote you in your book and said, help, I'm living with a stranger. I was randomly assigned a roommate, and now I'm a nervous wreck thinking about living with someone I have never met before. Help me, what did you tell her? <laughs> Well, first I said, I'm just so proud of you. <laughs> Even if it's not your choice, which for most of us, our freshman year at least, we live with someone randomly assigned to us. It's right. not really our choice, right. but I'm still proud. I'm proud of you for, for doing this, for taking the step. Um, this is so counter-cultural. Mm -hmm. We live in a world where it's all about me, it's what I want, and it's trying to find the most comfort possible. I wanna live comfortably. And living with a stranger, living with anyone in a teeny tiny room is going to be uncomfortable <laughs> yes. at times. Yes. So, you know, I think more than anything, just remembering it doesn't matter if you are living with an angel or someone that is going to drive you crazy every day, it's going to be difficult. Right. Because you're living in a small room with someone that's not you. Right, exactly. And so it's going to be a challenge, but it's a great challenge. The things that you learn, if you will press into your roommate conflicts, it will mature you and grow you beyond 
maybe anything in college. Right, yes. And I know being an only child, I looked forward to college, you know, because I thought, oh good, I get to have sisters down the room, yeah. you know, not knowing what I was going to face. And you know, I went to a small Christian college and we could have up to four girls in a room, mm -hmm. you know, so you're thinking it's not just me and another person, it's four of us in there who have never lived together. And you know, how are we gonna handle the situations and problems that arise? And so you talk a little bit about that. So what are some of the problems that girls when you are living with a stranger experience? Well, as you said, we're living in a tiny space <laughs> with one, two, three, four right. other folks that we've never met before. So not just um, personality conflicts, but a lot of times I find the, the most generic conflict is just a night owl versus a morning person. <laughs> yes. So we have different schedules. We have different things we want to use our room for. Some of us want to use our room just for socializing. Right. Others want to use our room for studying. So the idea of interacting with someone that's different th from you, whose bed is literally feet away, who might want to go to right. sleep at 8 p.m. or stay awake until 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things can bring tension into that room. Right, it is such a balance because, you know, like you said, you have the ones that are night owls or morning people and some that are not, and then just dealing with, you know, well, I do want to study in here or I want all my friends to come over here, you know, and how you deal with that with your roommates and, and all the things that come along with yeah, it. Yeah, but I want to jump in here, okay? <laughs> because uh, Hannah, you're very realistic in your book, okay? One of your years, you know, every year you get assigned new roommates. One of your years, you said, your first semester, this must have been a freshman year, you're a month into college and you're daydreaming about poisoning your roommate, <laughs> hiding the body someplace. <laughs> and uh, then you said, uh, oh, that was just me, uh, kind of hyperbole, you know, uh, but uh, did your roommate really bother you that much that you were thinking about, you know, where can we hide the body here? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I was, I was really going to kill her, you know, I think that would have been a, a little over the top. Um, but she drove me crazy. My roommate and I could not have been farther apart on the scale of, uh, let's just say, of differences. And she was a true and true hippie, pot smoking, free loving, uh, didn't ever sanitize a thing, including herself. Mm -hmm. She would cook food in our our hallway, our dorm, you know, had a our, our dorm had a communal kitchen that we would all use and she would cook food and bring it back to our room on dishes that should be washed and reused. <laughs> and they would just stack up in our room for for the year, for nine months. And oh, yeah. green fuzz and living things started growing and <laughs> sounds started emitting, you know, from these piles of and odor. dirt and right. smoke. Yep. And she would sleep under all of it, all of her clothes were piled up onto a mattress. Um, so we had an invisible line down our room. That was your stuff, and this is my stuff, and I don't want you to touch my stuff, and I definitely don't want to touch your stuff. And she was very sweet, and she was kind, and that took us a long way. Um, but we could not have been more different, and the way she lived and the way our room looked aggravated me to my core. I was a neat freak, tidy, my bed was made every day. Um, it was really hard. Yeah, I think I, I love the story where your parents came to visit you and uh, they looked over at this, this blanket which was covered with dishes and all kinds of <laughs> old food. And what they didn't realize is that your roommate was sleeping underneath sure. that blanket. <laughs> you know, Michelle was a neat freak as well. Okay, yes. Oh, yes. and uh, I think Everything you ought to tell Hannah uh, what you did with uh, some of your roommates. <laughs> well, I know with one of my roommates that I had, she um, she couldn't hang up a piece of clothing to save her life. You know, everything was on the floor. And when she'd walk out of the room, she would just throw everything on the floor. And so I could not handle that because like <laughs> you, I had to have everything in its place. And so I would just throw everything onto her bed. Yeah. And so by the end of the year, I thought, you know what, maybe I should help this girl. <laughs> you know, maybe we should hang up some clothes. Mm -hmm. And so finally one day I took her aside and said, okay, we need to look at your clothes and hang some things up. And you know, she's like, I never knew that I had some of these. You know, I was like, well, if you would hang this up, then you can find things, you know? And so, but it was things like that, that I just ended up doing things for my roommate sure. because I was like, I cannot handle the mess. Yeah. So either I need to leave or I'm gonna do something about this, you yeah. know? Yeah, practically, let's get in here and ask this question. What did you do? What mm. can a girl do <laughs> mm -hmm. if you get a room like a uh, roommate like that, okay? What's, what's your options? Your options are to confront her, to get over it, 
or to let it drive you absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And most of us choose a combination of those three things. I chose to confront her. Again, she was a sweet girl. I didn't have a problem you know, speaking up and saying, hey, this is driving me crazy. I, I need you to think about doing X, Y, Z. Um, but of course, nothing ever changed mm -hmm. and it drove me insane. Sane. Mm -hmm. So later on, past college, I'm living with, you know, as a, as a single woman, still having roommates. Um, I learned that the dishes in the sink, again, I'm a neat freak. It's my, that's my problem too. You know, it, yeah. it, we each have our own problems <laughs> on this side of, of on the scale. Yeah. Um, my roommates were leaving dirty dishes in the sink. We have a dishwasher that is right there, ready to be loaded. It drove me crazy. I would walk in the door from work happy, good mood, I would see all the dishes in the sink and just just lose it, yeah. steam's coming out of my ears. And I finally had a friend laugh at me, I was talking about it one day and she said, you are letting a dirty dish completely steal your joy. Mm -hmm. You've had a great day, you're in a great mood and a dirty dish is what sends you over the edge. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, yes, I think we should always communicate and talk to our roommates if they're doing something, we don't let them step over all of us. Right. You didn't let your roommate just continue throwing her clothes everywhere. Right, so let's right, talk about it. Right. But at the end of the day, they're probably not gonna change. Yeah. So the only person I can control is myself and I get to right. control my attitude and the way I respond to it. And right. so as an adult, I realize we can talk about the dirty dish, but if it doesn't get into the dishwasher, I can put it in the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a problem. It doesn't steal my joy. We're all fine. I'm not enabling them, but again, they're not gonna change. So if this is my issue, I can put it in the dishwasher and get over it. Yeah, let me right. jump to something here because you got two things going. One, you're saying confront that person. Yeah. Okay, millennials and young women are not usually in this category of saying, hey, let's sit down and talk, mm -hmm. okay? And then really being truthful with them, mm -hmm. okay? And then number two, it's gotta be discouraging if you have that talk and you're saying, count on it, she's gonna do it again, <laughs> yeah. all right? So as a Christian yeah. woman living with a roommate like this, mm -hmm. how did you make it through three months and you're saying anybody can live with somebody like that for a semester and you're saying everybody should try to live with them for the whole year mm -hmm. and I'm saying, oh yeah, really? <laughs> how, how can they do that? Certainly there are times that maybe, okay, I do need to look for a new living situation. But more often than not, you are treating a set of known problems, you know the things that your roommate does that drives you crazy, for a set of unknown problems. Right. Because every roommate situation is going to have problems. Mm -hmm. So if you know what the problems are, you continue to manage them. And again, I mean, if God is sovereign over everything in your life, is he not sovereign over your roommate? Did he not know who you're gonna be placed with? And so my encouragement is consider how God might be planning to use that relationship, to use that roommate, mm -hmm. to grow you and to make you more like him. Right. Yeah, and okay, this is just a fascinating conversation, folks. It's called The College Girl's Survival Guide, a new book that Hannah Seymour, our guest today, has written, and it's just flying off the shelves. And if you're a mom and you've got a girl that's going to go to college or you've got uh, a, a girl, your daughter that's already in college, uh, this is something that she needs to have with her because it's got the 52 major concerns that college women have, okay, that they're gonna face going to college. And we are talking about roommates, okay? And sometimes roommates are assigned to you and you have no choice and sometimes you don't always get the best one and I'm taking a worst case scenario that actually happened to Hannah, okay? She's a Christian woman, but she's living with a non-Christian woman and she's got this problem. And she, you write, my roommate is constantly waking me up in the middle of the night because she's coming home drunk. Mm -hmm. She's loud, she's obnoxious and totally oblivious that I'm already in bed asleep. And then the next morning, she acts like everything is fine. I try to talk to her about this, but I can never find the right words to say. Should I move out or should I stick with it? Okay, and what did you decide? So number one, you have to talk to your roommate about it. If this is your scenario, 
you've got to communicate and explain to her, hey, when you're coming home drunk, because here's the deal, she may not even realize what she's doing, right? right? So when you're coming home, you're turning on the light, you're making all this noise, you're waking me up, it takes me an hour to fall back asleep. Mm -hmm. Now here's where it gets tricky because most girls in this scenario sitting on my side would say, she should just not come home drunk. She needs to be home by 10 when I wanna go to bed. Um, but it is her room too. And while you may not agree with her decisions and the way she's living her life, it's her life. Mm -hmm. And she gets to do what she wants to do and she gets to live the way she wants to live in her room, which is also yours, but it's also hers. So. Girls hate, when we talk about this, they hate this because they think there shouldn't need to be a compromise. I should win. I'm the one in bed asleep. But we do, we have to compromise. And so so what's the compromise going to be here? Um, maybe, so the bright light's bothering you, so maybe we need to buy a dim light that's easy for her to snap on. It's not going to cast full light in the room while you're sleeping. Maybe, um, maybe there's something else she's doing that's aggravating you that, you know, she can try to help with. Maybe you just need to get earplugs or wear an eye mask. Again, I mean, I know that seems so unfair, but we talked to her about it, but we both try to figure out how, how can we continue on to where this isn't waking me up for an hour, et cetera. The thing that's so hard is you're gonna sit down and you're gonna confront your roommate and you're gonna have a heart to heart about it, and I guarantee she will do it again that Thursday, Absolutely. Friday, Saturday, Absolutely. Sunday, whatever. Right. So that's where it's crucial that right when it happens in the moment, when that light goes on, you know, I tell girls, you need to sit up in bed right then and go, hey, I, hey, so sorry, can you turn off the light and turn on the dim light? Whatever you've already agreed upon, you need to say it in the moment. You can't just roll over and try to ignore it. Say in the moment, and then again the next morning, you've got to address it, right? Because she's, prob she's right. coming home drunk. So right. who knows <laughs> how great of a conversation we can have at that exactly. moment. Right. Yeah. So the next morning, hey, it happened again last night. I know we had talked about this. Can you still stick to those terms? We've agreed on a compromise. Is, does that still seem like a fair compromise that you can work through? Um, the good news is that the majority of the time, people are reasonable. You yep. know, unless you just have a, a nasty, mean streak roommate who just does not care at all, you mm -hmm. probably have a roommate that, you know, is like, I'm sorry, sure she's selfish and wants to do what she wants to do, but deep down, she probably wants to compromise too. So remembering that and trying to just press on, continue through, continue talking about it, communicate about it, and hopefully things will get better. Yeah, in, in your book, you said as a Christian too, you yeah. can't be a chicken. You can't just move out yeah. without saying anything. Yeah. You need to have the courage to actually confront mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you need to talk about that and encourage the folks that aren't used to having to confront people with those kinds of problems. Right. Mm -hmm. So it may be your roommate today, but after college, it's going to be a coworker, a boss, a friend, um, maybe someday a spouse. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be people the rest of your life that you need to have hard conversations with. And you can't just move out. You can't just leave your job when things get tough. People do, but it's not the way we wanna live, right? So as a believer, thinking about how do I stick it out in these tough relationships? How do I, A, let God do his handiwork, what he's best at, changing me first and others, um, and how might this grow and mature me to be even better at handing conflict and confrontation and communication skills in the future? Also, I mean, I can't shake. Jesus told us two greatest commandments, right? Love the Lord, love your neighbor, and it doesn't get much closer than your roommate when we're talking about who's your neighbor. Right. And so how might God wanna use me in this roommate relationship? How might he want me to love her the best I can because he loves me unconditionally, he's forgiven me unconditionally. How might that impact the way that I relate to my roommate? Right, yeah. it's also that it's not about you. And you know, we try to fix the problem or try to fix that roommate and we can't. And you know what you talked about that, we get in those situations and just even in life where you just want to quit and say, I'm done, you know, and you say, stick it out, you know, whether it's three or four months and maybe even try a whole year, you know, and I know a lot of women out there would say, but I can't do that, Hannah. <laughs> so, you know, how am I going to do this? Yeah. 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 I think you can do anything for nine months. I mean, truly. And so if you're praying about it, if you're trying to stick in it, I think you will only, you will never regret trying to stick it out. You might regret walking away. 
All right, let's get to the bottom line then. How do you know when it is time to call it quits? I think it comes down to if there is absolutely no effort on her part to compromise and a big and there's got to be another option for you so you know you can't i know michelle your situation you weren't allowed to move right, out right so there literally has to be that option um and sometimes if it's impacting your ability to sleep and go to class i mean there there are roommate scenarios where it is so overwhelming it is harmful to a student mm -hmm. and at that point it's time to get out right. um, and time to move on mm -hmm. yeah but I also like what you said, that realistically, no matter who your roommate is, okay, you're going to have conflict. You yes. can mark mm -hmm. it down. Yes. And so as a Christian woman, why does God allow these conflicts to come into your mind to put you into this situation mm -hmm. where you're in a small room, maybe just two beds or even three or four beds, and the fact is you're sharing one bathroom and the fact is things are really kind of tense in the room. Why mm -hmm. does God allow this stuff to happen to you? Mm -hmm. In my book, I look at several different biblical stories of people, of amazing men and women of God who he puts in leadership positions. He uses them in mighty ways. They face innumerable challenges, hardships, and difficulties. And I think that it is so true that God uses, I think sometimes God gives us the challenge and other times the challenge is there. He's sovereign over it but he is going to use it to grow you and mature you to become the woman or man he's designed you to be amidst your difficult situations. And if he can mold you and shape you during those times, mm. you're gonna be ready for the impact, the influence that he, that he wants to wield through you. Let me ask you a personal question. Yeah. What was the biggest one that you faced? What did God change in you the most? My first year roommate situation was hard, but probably the hardest thing I faced was during my junior year, I had a boyfriend that I thought I was in love with and he broke up with me. My family uh, made a decision to move from Virginia, which is where I was in college, to Chicago. It just kind of felt like my world was crumbling around me. Everything that I held tight to, everything that brought me comfort was changing and being stripped away. And it seems so silly to me today and dramatic, but at that time, it was overwhelming and I cried most nights as I went to sleep. Um, and I remember clinging to different verses and Psalms that David had written, you know, who, who do I have but you on this earth? This earth has nothing, um, only in you. And I really learned to place my trust and confidence and comfort only in the Lord. No longer can I hold on to these other things. It's just Jesus. Um, it was the greatest hardship and the greatest lesson that I think really carried me into adulthood. Yeah, as a woman, God was shaping you and designing you into the woman he wanted you to be in the future. Mm -hmm. And it took the kinds of pressures that you faced. And I'm glad you brought up this thing of a boyfriend because mm -hmm. next week we're going there, okay? Mm -hmm. Should college be about finding your future husband. Now this is a woman's question, okay? And in the back of their mind, they might not be saying it out loud, but maybe their parents found each other at college, so they say in the back of their mind, in fact, you had this in the back of your mind, my parents got together at college, so somewhere along the line, this, this thing is gonna just pan out and it's gonna come together. But it didn't. We're gonna talk about this whole thing about should that be one of our goals, spoken or unspoken, in our program next week. I hope you'll join us. I hope you've enjoyed today's program featuring Hannah Seymour. If so, you'll want to receive a copy of her new best-selling book for young women called The College Girl's Survival Guide. Hannah's best insights are in this book, including answers to the top 52 questions she's received about roommates, boyfriends, choosing a major, balancing family and school life, sexual assaults, and much more. And you can request your copy of her book for a gift of only $15. You'd also like to have a copy of today's television programs with Hannah to watch again or share with a young woman entering college or already in college. You can receive all five television programs in our series on DVD. In our programs, Hannah addresses the misconception of believing that college is the best four years of your life, of dealing with roommates that you've never met before, 
handling the stress of coursework, and choosing or changing a major, how to find friends to help you grow in your faith, how to handle the loneliness of being away from family and friends, and the problem of sexual assaults. The five programs in this series come in a special package with both Blu-ray and DVD formats and includes a copy of Hannah's best-selling book, The College Girl's Survival Guide. They're available together for a gift of only $64. Then additional copies of her book can be requested for $15 each. Then finally, to protect your faith in Jesus, I'm also making available two important series that I've recorded called So You Don't Fall Away From The Faith and Questions The World Will Ask About Your Faith. These programs feature one of the world's foremost New Testament scholars and apologists, Dr. Daryl Bach. He answers the questions, how do we know that the information in the New Testament books contain the best historical evidence there is for what Jesus said and did? Was the message Jesus preached changed over time by the early Christians? Or has Jesus' message remained the same right down to our day? How did the early Christians come to the conclusion that the apostles' books and letters were to be considered scripture equal in authority with the Old Testament scriptures? And who decided which books would become part of the canon of scripture? And then my second series with Dr. Bach is called Questions the World Will Ask About Your Faith. Here we explain why Jesus never intended for anyone to conclude he was just another religious leader. Rather, he wanted people to know he was God in human flesh. How do we know that Jesus really rose from the dead and actually appeared to over 500 people? Can the resurrection appearances be explained away by different psychological theories today? These programs will help you remain strong in your faith and prepared to answer questions your friends on campus will ask you about Jesus. And you can request all three of these resources, including Hannah Seymour's best-selling book, The College Girl's Survival Guide, our five-program DVD series with Hannah called The College Girl's Survival Guide, and then our six programs with Dr. Daryl Bach on DVD for your gift of only $99. You may request all of this information in this special package right now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may also request these materials at our website, at jashow.org.